so I'm Scott. Uh, I'll be sharing the stage with uh, Professor Franchetti, Franz, uh, in a few minutes. I want to talk about our project, which is in the first of three, or just completed the first of three years, uh, in a big long title, Co-Optimization of High Performance Data-Intensive Computing and Resource-Constrained Environments, and I'll unpack that as we go. Um, this is our CMU team. We're, we're partnering with a number of professors at the ECE department. We have expertise in reconfigurable computing, so FPGA and ASIC design, algorithm development and high performance engineering of those algorithms, and automated code generation. This is a continuation of about five to six years of investment at the SEI. I've been working with Franz for three years, been talking to each other for five. Uh, we just got done uh, code generation for graph algorithms specifically. We're raising the abstraction level up to machine learning algorithms. So graphs are a tool for machine learning. We heard yesterday that machine learning is a tool for AI systems. So we're pushing the level of abstraction up the chain. More exciting though is as a result of this body of work, an entire research community has sprung up in an international research community in how we specify graph algorithms and how that specification can enable automated code generation, which Franz will be talking about. Uh, that's the graph BLAS community. BLAS stands for basic linear algebra subprograms. I'll explain what that means in a minute. But more importantly, that research community is driving investment at the DOD in advanced computing architectures. Uh, we are involved in the D DARPA Electronics Resurgence Initiative uh, in a couple of programs, DARPA Hive and DARPA SDH, Software Defined Hardware. This is our problem solution approach slide. We'll be unpacking a bunch of this, but I really want to stress that Data intensive computing stresses hardware architectures in a way that makes it very difficult to get performance out of these systems. More importantly, cost size, weight, and power constraints in mission applications puts stress on the hardware you can choose. So there's more adoption of FPGAs and ASICs, making these hardware systems even more complex, making the programming problem even more difficult. And so we are striving to achieve code generation in this space, not only to create high performance code, but code generation that can also inform us as to the hardware components that we should choose to achieve the C-swap constraints that missions require. So like I said before, we've been working in graphs for a number of years. Uh, it turns out that the graph abstractions that we've created do have uh, applicability in ML algorithms, but we are looking at additional abstractions that will support more, more of the ML algorithm space and pushing into the AI systems. This is today's COTS hardware landscape. Um, data intensive computing is very sensitive to the memory architectures that are present in these from chips all the way to supercomputers. Um, you can spend an inordinate amount of time trying to tune your code for one, one chip, and then when in the next acquisition cycle you get a new computer and your code doesn't run very well. This is even more pronounced in what's coming. What we're seeing at DARPA is a new zoo of hardware architectures to address data intensive computing. Uh, each one of these will require a tremendous number of effort, a tremendous amount of effort to tune those, those applications. And so we want to get in front of that. And how we're going to do that is through a separation of concerns. What we want to do is separate the complexity of developing algorithms, machine learning, AI, graphs, from the complexity of tuning them for specific hardware. In software engineering, that's generally done with an application programming interface. Uh, the goal is to define a set of computational operations, some, some few data structures, 
and then allow the algorithm writers to write against that interface. The goal is then with cooperation or the help of hardware vendors and, and uh, developers, have the developers or the hardware folks implement those few operations um, very, very high performance ways so that with one piece of code, we can run everywhere fast. But when you're talking about graphs and data intensive computing, it's, um, it can be a little confusing about what the proper API is. Uh, this is. This is a slide from my collaborator at Intel. He pulled a down a bunch of graph, graph APIs. And it's, it, there, there is no cons broad consensus as to what the right API is. But in the last couple of years, based on some of our prior work, there is a growing community adopting graphs in the language of linear algebra. So we treat graphs as sparse matrices. We do operations on sparse matrices to do computation on graphs. It turns out that sparse computations don't apply just to graphs. It's, it is a, broad, um, a broader um, mathematical concept that applies to most data intensive computing. Um, graph laws started formally with the mathematical foundation in 2016, defines the set of mathematical operations that we want to support. A year later, we came out with the, the C API specification, so it tells us what the functions should look like in the C language. The primitives that we've chosen are maybe 10 total. Uh, the large ones, the, the biggest, most important ones are sparse matrix, matrix multiply, sparse matrix times vector, element-wise operations between sparse matrices and sparse vectors, and the ability to extract subsets of sparse uh, data structures. We do have reductions and transposes and a few other things that help with, with the full uh, algorithm pipeline. I showed a version of this slide last year. All the updates are in blue. So last month at IEEE HPEC, we released version 1.3, so the fourth version of the GraphBlaws API. Uh, the exciting thing there is that we are starting to build in operations that allow for dynamic data. We can add and remove components from, uh, from these graphs so they can grow and shrink as the data changes. Um, in the back end, we've gone into, we, the community, have gone into focusing on performance. So we had a few reference implementations a couple of years ago. Uh, Sweet Sparse was the first. It is now uh, multi-threaded using OpenMP in the back end. So now it can do uh, multi-core shared memory systems and get much better performance. Uh, we're working with Lawrence Livermore, we, the SEI specifically. They want to put a version of graph laws on top of their distributed system so that they can do graph laws on their supercomputers. Um, a performance engineering group at the University of Texas, Gawa, is actually building a graph laws interface on top of their technology. So that's the back end. The front end, above the API, there is focus on usability. So in the community, we have members working on Python wrappers so that we can engage the, the large body of data scientists and ML researchers. Uh, there is even a Postgres wrapper, so pushing up into the higher level languages. And, and the one that I'm really excited about is the community effort to, do, to collect the best algorithms implemented in graph laws. So without concern for the implementation of the hardware, What's the best way to specify algorithms that are important? Um, we had started with the, the C++ algorithms repository here at SEI. A lot of those algorithms are now in the LA graph with more to come. Uh, and most recently, people have started um, providing algorithms in the ML space, specifically dense neural networks. But with all this activity, Optimizing the back end is still hard. So for all those efforts in increasing performance in the back end, you're going to get 
a static runtime library targeting a specific hardware architecture. So one would be shared memory, multi-core. Another one would be distributed. It won't get you a broad capability. And with all the new architectures coming up, um, it, it's still difficult, time consuming, and costly. And how we're dealing with that, I'm going to invite Franz up to talk about. Thank you, Scott. And it's my pleasure to be back. It's always a pleasure to be here uh, presenting work together with Scott. It's been going on for three years now, funded, and five years or so unfunded uh, before. And what you have seen uh, on uh, one of the early slides was what kind of research group has grown out of that collaboration. And Scott's really a family member over at campus nowadays. Uh, and it's really great to work together, but moreover, the way he kind of like contributes really is the enabling step for us to be able to do what we're doing. And let me explain. So Spiral is a program or project that's been going on at uh, CMU for about 20 years, originally started by, by Lou Auslander, and then uh, so just, uh, Jose Mura, who is currently uh, president of IEEE, was the first long-term PI, then Markus Puschel, who went back to ECH Zurich, was the next PI, and I'm kind of like the third PI, kind of like the grand, uh, grandchild PI on the project. And the idea of the project since the beginning was that typically when you want to get high performance, you figure out the right laser pointer first, the algorithms, and then you have some people implement stuff, and then you get something high performance, like a high performance GPTL library. What we're doing is almost the same thing. We have the books, but then we have an automatic system that basically does that. And then the only question is, well, how does this compare? And you're going to get the same performance. Otherwise, uh, it's no good to have it automated. And the thing here is now, we started uh, 20 years ago to kind of like uh, compete with FFTW and FFTs because signal processing was the thing back then. Nowadays, we're doing it across a wide range of things. And one of the things is Jeremy uh, Kepner's book from uh, Lincoln Lab up here, the uh, graph algorithms in the language of linear algebra. And that is the thing. We are formalizing these algorithms, putting all these representations into an automatic system that then can do as well as human hand tuners can do. And the important step here is to be able to take something that's written as math in a book and put it into an automatic system. It turns out Spiral over the years has grown into really an AI system to optimize AI systems. It's kind of like AI for AI in a way, if you wish. And so now what we're doing in the SEI project is kind of like taking that idea and really pushing it all the way through. And so the key component, that's where really Scott comes in and talks to us at the campus all the time, is what's the math and what's the underlying algorithms of all these graph algorithms and AI algorithms. And so thing is, for example, you want to do something like uh, triangle counting. You get some equation that has some trace of a matrix, some norm, one norm, and blah, blah, blah and some scalar product, and some semi-ring. And if you read Jeremy Kepner's book, you know exactly what it means. And I had three students try to read it, and they all went belly up. Then I turned to Scott, and he explained it to us. And since then, we can actually do the work. And so, uh, and I'm not joking. I kind of like got a preprint of Jeremy early on, and I tried student one, two, three. And so, uh, basically, you have to have the right domain expert who understands what's written, and you can talk to him. Scott's background in automatic, uh, in performance engineering and the algorithms and knowing the missions and all of that was kind of like the absolute key. And so we could actually go in and grab the content of that book and put it in, put it in the system. And now, what does it mean to put it into the system? It means we have complicated high-level abstractions, uh, multiple layers, a lot of representations on a math level, on a program level, rule-based compiler, uh, it's a lot of formal systems, it's a lot of math, it's a computer algebra system that's 20 years in the works underneath uh, everything. And after running for a while, it does automatically what humans do by hand. And it really is kind of like putting constraint solving, high level information representation, uh, inf um, search space exploration, all that new stuff in there to automate what the human would be doing. And so we have, again, high level abstractions, code level abstractions, some math, some rule-based compilation, all interacting, and it's been a string of like three, four DARPA programs over the years that we're leveraging here. And what's really happening is we have 
a red space, a blue space, and a gray space, which means there's something that represents algorithms, something that represents hardware, and something that represents program transformations. And then the computer plays Lego with itself and figures out how to build from all this information the best uh, high performance implementation it can. And there is uh, the formal approach that we have to put in, and you can get some design space exploration, and you can ask inverse questions. That goes back to Tony Tatter asking us, so which one of these chips is the best one? I don't want to have to find a program to uh, run every one of those. And so that's basically where it all comes from. But what really happens is you have uh, this library here, and it looks like a program to the user. The user thinks they're writing against an API like the Graph Plus. But behind the scenes, an automatic AI system starts working and figuring out how to really run it on the machine. And that is really important to design it like that, because if you design an API and you design it too small, you can't get any performance because you can't capture all the corner cases. If you design it too big, nobody can use it because you have combinatorial explosion in the parameters. So what you have to do is you have to multiple API calls, join them together in a just-in-time compilation kind of way, and then automatically produce the right code for the right hardware in the back end in a way that the humans uh, don't have to interact. If you try to do that completely automatically, you're going to fail. We've tried that for many, many years with all these high-level compilers, and it doesn't work. You have to have a backdoor where the human programmer can add information to the system, which is like, here is our kind of like the back, uh, back door, where we can add information to the right part, which is the system, to kind of like teach the system after the fact how to actually target the hardware. And that's coming out of Sandeep Nima's DARPA Pras program that's uh, coming to a conclusion uh, in the next month. And so doing all of that, now we suddenly can target uh, machines that we didn't know 20 years ago that they exist, like FPGAs, GPUs, and so forth. And we can target algorithms that we didn't know 20 years ago that exist, like graph algorithms, by basically having a scalable system that's meant to be forward compatible and add the information in the back end time after time after time. And so one of the things that we've been doing in the last three years was support for FPGAs, where we leverage the tool chain, all the top parts, and only in the very, very bottom you see a fork. And then at the very end, we actually produce something like fat binaries that then run on a GPU or a CPU or an FPGA. And so that's been the game that we've been playing for a long time. And so when you look through the... Um, Flow, what you see is you start with the problem specification, triangle count, or something else in the AI ML place. Then some algorithm choice happens. That's where Scott's knowledge comes in. And then eventually, we derive automatically the actual true algorithm level and data flow. That's where the computer algebra system automates what Scott taught us. And then eventually comes code, where we add some low-level code optimization, like how do you do pointer chasing efficiently on an emu or something like that. And then eventually you get some C codes that, and that code is almost like assembly that you do not want to read at all because it's machine generated. And then it actually works. And that's just kind of like to scare you. It's kind of like some inter intermediate representation, some actual C code. And what turned out to happen is that we were able to automatically generate the same codes that the year before our students wrote by hand to win the HPEC uh, graph challenge. Uh, so, some price there. And so we kind of like up there automatically uh, with what the best students could do by hand before. And so, yeah, if you want to see that, uh, you can download the tool and you can come to my office. I can show you. That's kind of like beyond the scope of doing it right now here. But the thing is, uh, we're looking forward. And here is the work where the AIML project that you're doing right now comes in. Graphs was the first step, but we also have to add in DNNs, CNNs, um, all kind of stuff. We have to target GPUs. We have to do spiral as the front end, as I said, for Graph Plus. And uh, with Larry Pilegi, now department head in ECE, and with the new Apple initiative that we have, we're actually working on making accelerators really fabbing chips out of spiral AIML eventually. And so there's some work where student, uh, where Scott was involved a lot, um, graduated is at Intel now, and uh, his work uh, looks like a good candidate going to chips. And so, yeah, the whole work uh, led to uh, some uh, nice wins at uh, the Graph Plus Challenge. So Spiral has been around for 20 years. It's now uh, open source uh, with BSD license. And so whoever wants to try it, uh, send me an email. Um, yeah, it's been going on for a long time. And now, really, we are trying to push it out. And yeah, so Scott and I, we have a lot of external collaborators on that. This is more Scott's side. 
And so that's why I'm handing back the pointer to him right when the time runs out. So, yeah. Is this on? OK. Um, yeah, I showed the CMU team at the end. This is actually the team of people that I interact with on a regular basis because this is a community effort. I just wanted to call out some of the important folks for this project.